Nowadays, accelerometers are used for a variety of inspections, tests or measurements, such as in environmental simulation on vibration generators or impact testing machines, in machine maintenance or in structural analysis and so on. These sensors are usually highly reliable over a long period of time. As a result of ISO 9000, it is now frequently common practice in companies and institutes for faulty measuring instruments to be identified during tests and during calibration cycles. This presentation is going to focus on possible errors and damages that can happen with measuring with accelerometers and how to simply troubleshoot those kind of issues. Physical or environmental conditions are the most frequent cause of accelerometer damage. Misusage and problems can occur as follow. First of all, dropping a sensor onto a hard surface can cause internal damage. All accelerometers are designed to withstand a certain impact load, which, if the specification is reliable, should also include a minimum shock time and form. If this limit is exceeded, damage may occur. Second, using sensor above or below certain temperature range can result in damage, particularly to IEP accelerometers because of their internal electronics. Ultrafast cooling, such as immersion in liquid nitrogen, boiling temperature being minus 196 degrees C, can also lead to damage. The pyroelectric effect with ferroelectric and meaning also piezoelectric ceramics here produce high charges, which can cause electrostatic discharges which damage the electronic. For example, in this unsuitable input test, sensor designed for a satellite died before entering the Earth's orbit. Number three, last but not least, if the hermetic sealing of the sensor case is lost, moisture may penetrate the sensor, which increases the conductivity of the crystal or the ceramic. This then affects the frequency response in the bottom range. But any moisture adhering to the case can also have an effect on the ground isolation of the case and potentially ground loop. Let's first look into one potential damage being thermal damage. First of all, if a temperature is higher than the limitation for an IEP or a capacitive or a piezoresistive sensor, might be the risk of overheating the integral electronic and kill the circuit. Second of all, about the piezoelectric element. If the sensor over it, the piezoelectric ceramics will always show the effect of depolarization in addition to any other damage to the equipment. This will lead to lower or even zero sensor sensitivity accompanied by a reduction in electrical capacitance. There may also be a significant reduction in insulation resistance on the piezoelectric measurement element. In contrast to piezoelectric ceramic, effects or damage on this type do not occur with piezoelectric single crystals, such as quartz, tourmaline, piezostar, or at least for as long as there is no thermally induced chemical degradation or decomposition of the crystal. Piezoelectric or ferroelectric single crystals naturally show remnant polarization below the phase transformation, the so-called curry point. Unlike ceramics, they do not have to be polarized in an electrical field, and as a result, once they have cooled down to below the curry temperature, they automatically regain their piezoelectric properties, even if they have been temporarily thermally depolarized. A reduction in the sensitivity of an accelerometer indicates that the piezoceramic sensor has overheated. 
it is practically impossible for purely piezoelectric sensor to show an increase. If there is still sufficient insulation resistance, the sensor can continue to be used when it has been calibrated. Another potential damage would be a mechanical one. The sensitivity and the frequency response characteristic are not interrelated with regard to potential defects. The sensitivity of a sensor can remain unchanged even if there is a noticeable change in the frequency response. But the opposite is also possible. Changes in the frequency response can be due to major sensor overloads with short shocks when the piezoelectric element or its mechanical preload have been damaged. Additional resonance effects below the principal resonance are then visible in the frequency response. Despite the cracks in the sensor element, the entire charge can be picked up and the sensitivity can remain actually unchanged. So you would not realize it just doing a sensitivity check. The rule of thumb generally applicable to shock measurement is that the shock time should always be longer than five times the period of natural resonance for the accelerometer when mounted. You have, one have to realize that dropping from a height of one meter onto a steel or concrete surface can easily result in a shock greater than 1000 G with a half sign shock times of about 100 microseconds. If the shock time at the same amplitude becomes even shorter, there is even more potential for damage. Even moving sensors on a truck with iron wheels across cobbles from one department to another has led in many cases to mass failures, particularly with more sensitive piezoresistive accelerometers. Here in this example, we are showing the drop from height 90 cm onto steel, concrete, hardwood floor, and rubber floor. We mentioned the 1000 G and 100 microsecond. Well, if actually you look into that test, we dropped the sensor on a steel surface that represented a pulse duration of 50 microsecond, so highly dynamic, and an amplitude of 14,000 Gs. This would kill most of standard accelerometers that are not designed for a shock. If you drop the sensor on a concrete floor, then you get a pulse with 100 microsecond with uh, an amplitude of 6,800 G. Then hardwood floor would only be one millisecond, so then it's not that harsh anymore with an amplitude of 680 G. Then rubber is absolutely not harsh at all. We would have a pulse duration of 3.2 millisecond and an amplitude of 210 G. So one needs to be very careful in handling the sensor, otherwise breakage can happen. One of the mechanical damage that can happen can be a lateral impact. We have discussed what is the transverse sensitivity in one of the previous presentation. As a reminder, shortly, we have a sensor that is supposed to measure in the Z axis and a misorientation of the axis of sensitivity inside the sensor due to its mechanical assembly can lead for that sensor to also have a small sensitivity toward X or Y axis. This is being characterized by the specific um, calibration uh, on a shaker and an abacus similar to the one shown below can show you which axis has a bit higher sensitivity and the sensitivity is provided in percent of the nominal sensitivity of the sensor. In this example, we did on purpose shock laterally a sensor and we did characterize then its transverse sensitivity. The way it's being characterized is we put a shaker with a lateral excitation and we rotate the sensor angle by angle 
step by step to see what is the transverse in each orientation. That's basically what's being shown on that curve at the bottom right corner, where then you see the display of percentage of cross sensitivity versus the uh, angle of orientation of your sensor compared to the transverse excitation of the shaker. In our test here, we were using an old sensor, 8608. Um, actually, when such a sensor is brand new, you should have a transverse sensitivity max around 1.2. But this sensor was kind of old and must have, um, must have been subjected already to lateral impacts from its usage. So when we start using it beforehand, this sensor was already showing us the yellow curve with a max of 3.6%. What we did is then we submitted that sensor to a lateral impact of 2000 G at 200 microsecond. There you can see that after the hit, we have an amplitude of the percent of cross torque or cross axis sensitivity that doubled. So you get to a maximum at percent seven. Then what we did is we did on purpose shock back in the other direction. And surprisingly, what you can see here, it's the blue curve, is that the max went back to a 3.4. That was a curious um, phenomenon that would obviously be explained by the sensi sensing element going back into place after the second shock. We have seen that diagram before but uh, it can then remind us that if after a transverse shock, we have a small misalignment of the sensitive element, this can bring you to a big increase in the cross-axis sensitivity. We already mentioned that once before, but let's remind it. If we have a slight 1% of tilt, in the sensing element um, orientation, that could lead you to virtually 2% cross-axis sensitivity increase. With older sensor, which can be more than 10 years old, if the mechanical preload in the preloading bolts of the seismic element is relaxed by fatigue or extensive sensor, shock events, the piezoelectric elements are completely unloaded and the shock amplitudes are clipped after a certain limit during shock measurement. This is being highlighted here in the shorts on the bottom right corner. With older compression sensors, this only occurs when strain is loading the element, also in both directions according to the shear principle. An example is given again here in the graph. The only way to obtain clues, clear clues about this type of aging or damage is from comparing shop wave measurement against a reference sensor using the back-to-back -back method. In the simplest case, you can also fasten the sensor to an impact anvil and use a semicircular hammer with a suitable attached rubber plate to generate a shock in the measuring direction with increasing amplitude. In certain circumstances, it is also necessary to measure in both measuring direction, which can be very difficult. It remains to carefully evaluate the results of a test and to perform a critical analysis. If at the double point there are two sensors mounting right next to one another and showing different results, this is a further clear clue that there is a dot amount amount the measuring instruments. Here, again, it is a striking fact that the fault is only demonstrable above a certain shock amplitude. Recalibration up to the rated amplitude is therefore often common practice for shock sensor in the aerospace applications, for example. We discussed up to now things that can happen to the sensor. But also be aware that damaged cables and connectors can increase the noise content in the signal. Damaged pins, for example, may occasionally prevent electrical contact. 
Sensors with charge output require special low noise cables that do not generate charges in the cable. This is also known as a triple electric noise effect. Although by no means cheap, cables must be considered as a wearing part. Everything we've mentioned up to now, all those problems, may sometimes be detected by means of a thorough visual inspection. Otherwise, the test described here in that slide and the following slide will help. Maintaining a record of usage for your sensors can help in eliminating defects. If your instrument management software efficiently tracks the long-term stability of characteristic properties, this will often give you some indication. Clamping and mounting surfaces often become damaged when mounting was done on surfaces with deep scratches or where tools have been used to remove residual adhesive. Measurements from 3 to 4 kilohertz require mounting surfaces that are virtually polished. Filling of mounting holes is not permitted as it produces convex surfaces which at least increase the cross sensitivity of the sensor when it is mounted. It could provide 0.6 degree tilt that, as we've seen before, can provide at least 1% transverse sensitivity. In addition, it would mean that the residual adhesive cannot be removed from the highly textured surface and that sensor insulation from anodized oxide layers of aluminum housings cannot be insured anymore when mounted. Ground loops then can occur. We will start first looking at how we can test the functionality of a purely piezoelectric accelerometer, meaning an accelerometer with charge output. Testing such a sensor makes more sense than testing a piezoelectric accelerometer with uh, integrated electronics, the IEPE ones. There are four important characteristics that can be measured when testing a piezoelectric sensor for damage. The electrical capacitance, the insulation resistance over the piezoelectric element with differential output or also pin to case, the sensitivity, more correctly, transmission coefficient, and last but not least, the sensor frequency response. For the IEP sensors, there are many possible faults for piezoelectric sensors with integral charge conversion. The seismic element, along with the electronics, may have been damaged as already shown before. The only way to test the internal amplifier is by stimulating the sensor. The following tests are the minimum for everyday practice. Number one, comparing the bias voltage of the internal amplifier with the original value. A variation of more than 2-3 volts from the rated value at 10 volts indicates that there is a failure and that the sensor should be given a more detailed examination. Most of the amplifiers available on the market with constant current excitation display the bias voltage or at least have a LED to indicate an inactive connection. If necessary, the bias voltage can quickly be determined with a DC voltmeter parallel to the sensor, as shown here in the picture. But you must also always make sure that the constant current specified for the particular sensor has also been set correctly. Second test, with certain sensors, changing in temperature can shift the bias voltage so that the measuring range is exceeded and signal are clipped. So it's very important to make sure that this doesn't happen by measuring the bias voltage at the temperature you expect to measure. Third test, Check the sensitivity at a reference frequency. A change in sensitivity indicates that the internal charge converter is faulty. And like a sensor with only a charge output, the sensitivity here can also increase or decrease. Any change indicates possible damage. You can use a reference shaker for that. Four tests. Test the lower range in the frequency response with older types, in particular, there is often a dramatic cut in frequency below 20 to 10 Hz. This is also a key indicator.
Determining the resonance frequency of an accelerometer is a simple way to test the effect of melting of the frequency response. We already discussed that, but also about the functionality of the sensor itself. A wide frequency range is stimulating by heating with an extremely short shock. This also stimulates the sensor on its resonance. In laboratories, this is usually done by melting the sensor on a tungsten block and heating it with a steel tipped model hammer or by hitting with a small screwdriver in the direction of the sensitive axis. We have shown that in a video earlier. The graphic you show here are examples of piezoresistive sensor in the time and frequency range. The resonance you can see is about 27 kilohertz, 20% of which is usually the operative range with a change in sensitivity of plus minus 5%. This is something we already mentioned before. This pencil break test we mentioned already several times earlier is also called the HSU Nielsen test per the S. ASTM E976. It's familiar from the measurement of structure borne noise and consisting of breaking the lead. The bandwidth of this test runs to about 10 megahertz. We are going to show in the next slide an example of application of that test to characterize the frequency response in three directions of a triaxial sensor. First of all, to show its capabilities in the three directions, but also to check that the sensor is still functional in those three directions. So as I mentioned, we're going to test one of our triaxial sensor 8766A250. So it's a 250G piezo star sensor. We will use the HSU Nielsen test. First, we mount our sensor on the x-axis. We come with a pencil break, break it, and directly read the FFT analysis out of our scope. We see that the first resonance is at 52 kilohertz, which is in line with our data sheet. We then continue with the y-axis test and break the lead on the tungsten block and read the first peak at 53 kilohertz, also pretty much in line with the data sheet. Z axis then breaking again and first resonance peak is being seen at 52 kilohertz this time. Here we have checked our sensor all those further resonance peak are due to possibly the tungsten block itself being threaded in different ways to be able to test the sensor, but also sometimes to the sensor design itself. If we summarize what we set up to now for charge output and IEP output sensors, a simple sensitivity check should come together with a frequency response check. Additional peaks in the frequency response or high cross-axis sensitivity through excessive lateral load or crack or breaks in the piezoelectric element after overload can be symptomatic of a broken sensor. The obvious way to test sensors of this type would be number one, to test with at least an electrodynamic single frequency point calibrator as provided by numerous manufacturers of approximately 159.2 Hertz. It's a reference frequency and at a G range of 10 meter per second square, one or one G. Second test would be to measure the frequency response for an accelerometer from approximately 20 Hz to above the resonance frequency. This can be done with a frequency sweep on a shaker or using those impact tests we mentioned before. Third test on a charge output sensor 
it is usually easy to measure the insulation resistance and the capacitance, and this can provide further clues about any damage or defects. Even dirty connecting sockets reduce insulation resistance and adversely affect measurement at very low frequencies. It is advisable to inspect accessories such as cable at regular intervals. Changes in the upper frequency range or reduction of the not so easily measured resonance frequency are indicative of mechanical sensor damage. If the sensor has been mechanically damaged or overloaded, there are changes to the transverse sensitivity and its direction and to the resonance on excitation in the transfer direction. Distortions or additional resonances can also occur in the frequency response. This you can see, for example, in this example here, in this curve, where you see additional peak in the curve. Other damages is possible. So this type of sensor should always be given a critical examination before you continue to use it. The example we have here shows the shift and also the additional resonance effects in the frequency response of an accelerometer after some mechanical damage. This is what you are looking for when you conduct such investigations. Well, once again, we want to thank you for uh, your attention. And if it's not already done, we invite you to listen to the three other presentations about sensor technology, about sensor specifications, and about sensor handling.